Shalom. This is Les Lawrence with Issachar Forum. Welcome back. We have a lot to cover today as usual, and uh, I'd like to begin with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, and we thank you that you sent your Son, Yeshua, Jesus, to be the Messiah and to save us, to save the world for all who would put his, their trust in him. We pray, Father God, Yehovah, in the name of Yeshua, Ben Yehovah, Jesus, the Son of God. Amen. I'd like to remind you to read my uh, blog commentary that I put up uh, once or twice a week on elishavision.wordpress.com. That's www.elishavision.wordpress.com. Uh, at the beginning of March, I put one up uh, outlining what I saw ha coming in March, major issues. Uh, one of them was the locust plague in Egypt. That sort of uh, dropped out of the news, but they're actually still around. Uh, some of them have even made it into Israel. Uh, in that, but the main things coming up were the uh, Israeli election, President Obama coming to Israel, and the new pope. And uh, so I want to talk about all three of those things today. And then the other thing I had mentioned was Passover. But last uh, week, just after I recorded the video, I got an email from a friend, uh, Vicki Kramer, who gave me uh, an interesting uh, quote from Sir Isaac Newton that I had never heard before. She sent it to me as an encouragement, and it was an encouragement to me, and I want to share it with you because the very fact that you're watching this video shows that you're also one of those uh, who fits into this category. Sir Isaac Newton said, uh, and he, of course, he's a famous scientist and theologian from uh, the, uh, he was born in 1642 and lived until 1727, and uh, he said this, about the time of the end, a body of men will be raised up who will turn their attention to the prophecies and insist upon their literal interpretation in the midst of much clamor and opposition. And that is my position. I, I uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek describe myself. People ask me, are you a futurist or a historicist or an amillennialist? What's your position? And I say, well, I'm a history futury literalist <laughs> I believe a lot of prophecies have already been fulfilled, and I think there are many that are still remaining to be fulfilled. And... All of them are literally revealed in the Bible. If we read the Bible and take it literally, we'll see what's happening. That's why we call this the Issachar Forum, a prophetic think tank, because in Chronicles it, it describes one of the tribes of Israel, the sons of Issachar, as men who understood the times and knew what Israel ought to do. And we want to be men and women of God who understand the times and know what God wants his people to do. And we can know, I believe. That's why I'm so passionate about uh, what I'm doing. Well, uh, let's go on and talk about some of the news. Um, first of all, I just want to make a few comments about the Pope, the new Pope uh, Francis. He's from Argentina, and uh, everybody's sort of scrambling to find out some of the background about him. And uh, uh, generally speaking, he's, he seems to be having a good uh, initial uh, impact, or it, people are appreciating the fact that he seems to be humble and cares for the people and prayed for the people, I mean, asked the people to pray for him uh, at his first uh, appearance and so forth. And uh, there's actually two completely conflicting reports about his background. One says that he's, because he's a Jesuit and he's from Argentina uh, and in South America, the Jesuits have been the leaders of liberation theology, which is a mixture of Catholicism and Marxism. Uh, and so he's been sort of guilty by association. And yet, uh, when you dig a little deeper, you hear just the opposite. You say you hear that Argentina was actually the least impacted by liberation theology, and it's primarily because of him. He has opposed it uh, in many cases in Argentina, and uh, and that he's actually uh, not holding those positions. He is uh, pro-life. He's against abortion. He's against homosexuality and biblically and so forth. So. My position is I'm just going to, I think we need to just wait and see what the Lord's going to do. Uh, we've talked in the past about the St. Malachi prof uh, prophecies of, uh, uh, I think it was the year 1290 A.D., prophecies of popes and saying that after Pope Benedict, the one associated with olives, would come Peter the Roman, the last, and he'd be the last pope. And so people were looking for some way to, is there any way that uh, this guy, uh, Pope uh, Francis can be considered Peter the Roman, and it's kind of a stretch to do it. I've heard somebody say it already, but it's, I, I think it's pretty, pretty much of a stretch. But uh, his parents were born in Italy, and, and he was born in Argentina, but of Italian heritage, 
So you, that's how you would have to say he's a Roman or the fact that he lives in Rome now as the Pope. And then uh, the only connection that you can really call him, you use the name Peter, has to do either the fact that he's the, the Pope who the Catholics believe uh, are in the line of Peter as the first Pope, which is Protestants don't agree with that, of course. And then the other thing is that St. Francis, the original St. Francis of Assisi, was originally named Peter. So any either way, uh, there's not very it's not a very clear <laughs> designation that that this pope could be called Peter the Roman, and uh, so that kind of casts new doubt on those uh, Malachi prophecies. So anyway, those were outside the Bible anyway. Never did give them too much uh, significance. Was so have to wait and see. Uh, there's a good article on theblaze.com, um, March 17th, which is today. Uh, say asking the question, is Pope Francis a socialist who will allow liberation theology to infiltrate the Catholic Church? And the conclusion of that particular article is uh, that he is not, and that he will not allow that, uh, and that he actually resisted liberation theology, as I said, uh, when he was in Argentina. And uh, you can read the whole article on theblaze.com if you'd like. And uh, I think that's enough about the Pope. But let's talk now about the Israel election. As it turns out, it came right down to the wire, and finally Saturday night at the deadline, Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu was able to submit uh, the new government to President Perez, and uh, it's now all the everything signed, and uh, it'll be sworn in, I think they say Monday, tomorrow, the Israeli government will be sworn in, and Wednesday they'll be meeting with uh, President Obama, uh, Netanyahu will as, as the newly re-elected Prime Minister. And I'll talk about the President Obama in a minute. But uh, the the election uh, came out, as it turns out, pretty much the coalition was, was what it looked like it was going to be at the at the time of the voting. It just took a while to make all the, the wheeling and dealing they have to do in a parliamentary system. And, uh, and so now there's actually 68 members uh, of the Knesset that are in the government. Uh, you have to have 61 in order to form a government, so that's a fairly stable number. Uh, it's not likely that it can be overthrown uh, very easily. And uh, a couple of more interesting things about the new government, uh, the, the, the new Secretary of Defense, the Defense Minister in the Israeli government, is uh, Moshe Ya'alon. Uh, he has a good reputation and uh, has, has been known as a really good uh, general and uh, leader in the in the. Uh, Israeli army, uh, IDF, and uh, I, I think it's just kind of neat to know that Moshe is the Israeli name for Moses, so Moses is now the head of the army in Israel, <laughs> and I don't know if he's going to be able to have the same uh, reputation as the first Moses, but uh, can't be all bad. Uh, then uh, one of the other significant developments of the new government is that it's uh, for the first time at, really in the history since 1948 of modern Israel, the extremely uh, dominant religious parties are completely left out of this new government. And there's a major change. Now, the why that's important, first of all, I'll, I'll explain that the religious parties are up in arms and they're claiming they're going to do everything they can to bring down the government. And that's understandable because they don't have power for the first time. Uh, but what does it mean for Israel? Um, I tend to think that it's a good thing because uh, some of those religious parties actually have the position that Israel shouldn't even be a state because they believe, no, they, their slogan is no state without a Messiah. They believe that the Messiah should come first before the state comes, and before the state is recognized. So they're really, in a sense, almost uh, against the government, and so they shouldn't really be in the government. Uh, and, and also, they control everything so religiously uh, in fact, I've got an example at the very end if we get to it today. Uh, they control things so religiously that it, it's the freedom of religion, even for Jews in Israel, is kind of hampered by the religious authorities, religious police, and so forth. And uh, it actually, I believe, opens up Israel for a, a more open system that will allow uh, all Israelis to actually connect to God. There are such things as... Uh, as religious Zionists and then the religious parties. The religious parties actually aren't Zionists, as I explained. They're, they don't think there should be a state until the Messiah comes. But there are a lot of religious Jews that love God, 
who believe God gave them the land, and their whole basis for their stand is on the Bible. And so I think it's good that those are the ones rising up in leadership in Israel. And uh, so we need to pray that uh, God's will will be accomplished in that. Now as we move towards uh, the, uh, the developments, uh, one, of the, one of the things, this current timing right now in history, a new Gallup poll uh, was reported on uh, Israel Today magazine, and it says American support for Israel is at an all-time high. That's interesting when you hear all the, the uh, pro-Palestinian propaganda, especially out of the university system in America, uh, and yet the actual people in polling, uh, it's 64% of all Americans actually side with Israel uh, in, rather than with the Palestinians. And uh, that equals the highest previous time, which was in 1991 during the first Gulf War, uh, when Saddam, Saddam Hussein was lobbing missiles at Tel Aviv. And uh, only today, only 12% of Americans said they sympathized with the Palestinian narrative of the conflict. And as usual, support for Israel was much higher among Republicans, 78%, uh, than uh, Democrats. But even the Democrats had a firm majority of 55% uh, stand with Israel. So that's, that's good news. And uh, I think it, it helps uh, Israel as, they, as Netanyahu now as a newly established and with a mandate kind of Prime Minister deals with Iran. Uh, now, let's talk about the uh, the trip of uh, President Obama this week. He's actually flying, I think it's Tuesday night, and their meeting, arrives Tuesday night late, and their meetings with, his meetings with Netanyahu and Israel leaders, and his speech in Israel will be on uh, Wednesday this week. And uh, we need to pay a lot of attention to that, of course. And there's a lot of uh, back and forth about what, it's, what his purpose is. Uh, from the White House perspective, they've kind of been downplaying. It says there aren't any new plans to spring something on Israel and pr pressure for peace process or whatever. And I hope that's the case. I hope there aren't. Uh, but uh, we now need to be praying. Uh, it, within Israel, their reaction, they've, they've never been too excited about Obama as much as uh, previous presidents. Uh, but uh, And there's one thing they're, the pop population is a little upset with. One thing is that uh, a high percentage of Israeli police are actually devoted to protecting Obama, and so for that day or two that he's in the in the area, uh, it's kind of open season for the Israeli citizens criminals to attack because the police are all going to be preoccupied, uh, as they should be. They need to protect the president, and uh, and I've said privately, I don't think I've said it on the video, but uh, I'm I'm a bit concerned. There's something kind of stirring in my heart that we need to really pray for. Uh, that, that nothing will happen to Obama while he's there. Uh, and that could just be a disaster. And, and uh, so we need to really pray whatever the enemy's purpose is. We bind that in the name of Jesus and stand only for God's purposes for Israel and for President Obama. Uh, another thing, uh, perhaps a more uh, serious flap going on in Israel is uh, that uh, he has invited uh, a thousand students from Israeli from every every Israeli university, uh, totaling a thousand students, are invited to his speech, with the exception of one university, Ariel University, which is in Samaria, which is the world calls the West Bank, and it's intentional. It's a snub. It's an offense. It's trying to make a political statement against uh, the West Bank and Israel and so forth. Uh, and and uh, and there's some pretty big uproar about it. In fact, one of the new leaders of the government of Israel, uh, Naftali Bennett, uh, says uh, Obama is spitting in Israel's face, uh, and uh, he's asking his supporters to protest Obama uh, and Obama's boycott of Israel University students. And um, they got a Facebook page, and they're trying to uh, you know make something of it, and. Um, so uh, it's very important, you know, why, why was Ariel not invited? Now, for those of you who've been keeping track, <laughs> let's go back to pr the president when he was first, President Obama was first president, he went to Egypt, spoke in Cairo, and at that time, the, the government of Egypt had outlawed the Muslim Brotherhood, and the, so the Muslim Brotherhood were not allowed to visit the, uh, t to be at the Cairo speech of President Obama. And, uh, but President Obama insisted 
that 15 members of the Muslim Brotherhood be permitted to come and come to his speech, even though they were outlawed by the Egyptian government. So here we now fast forward four years, the President Obama in his new term actually refusing to invite uh, members of Ariel University students uh, as a as a political statement. In fact, uh, one of the another minister of the Knesset um, uh, by the name of uh, Chetborn, Chetboon uh, is actually wrote a letter specifically to Obama asking him to invite the students of Ariel, and uh, he made the point. Um, he said, I was very disappointed to hear about your decision not to address the Knesset. He's, President Obama is not speaking in the Knesset. He's speaking publicly. And the reason he's not speaking in the Knesset that was given by the White House is uh, saying you wish to give a speech which is not political. Well, that's why he didn't speak at the Knesset. And yet he makes a very, very political stand to not invite the only university that Israel has that's in the West Bank or in Samaria uh, you can see why that is a uh, quite a hypocritic, uh, hypocritical position to take. Well, moving on, uh, one of the things that uh, Obama is going to have a photo op when he gets arrives in the airport. They're going to have an Iron Dome battery at near right brought into the airport just for his visit, to, so that there can be a picture uh, of Obama with the Iron Dome system, which has been so successful in turning back the rockets from Gaza, an 85 percent success rate, I believe it was. And, uh, and, of course, the U.S. has contributed a lot of money to the Iron Dome system, and so I do think that Obama will want to get his picture taken with it. And also, Obama's going to get a first-hand look. There's an article on the Times of Israel that uh, Obama, to get first-hand look at startup nations' innovations, uh, he's going to see remarkable examples of Israel's high-tech prowess and introduce some young pioneers. He's going to see robot robotic rescue snakes, motorized legs, road safety alert systems, and other trails ba trailblazing local developments in Israel. And uh, that's a good thing and get, get some publicity. Hopefully it'll be spread up a lot on the, uh, on the U.S. news while he's there. Uh, we need to pray that the coverage will be very positive while the president is in Israel, that, uh, that he will be, you know, that that'll draw attention to the good things that are going on in Israel. Uh, now a couple uh, more international things. Um, there's a in the elections in the United Kingdom, uh, the Labour leader, who is Jewish but has never made too much about his Jewishness, but he's running for prime minister. Uh, he declares himself a Zionist in a question and answer uh, period that was, uh, you know, before the the press and so forth. Riding high in the polls, Labour leader says he may not agree with every Israeli policy, but he owes the Jewish state a debt. And uh, his name is uh, is Miliband. Uh, the Ed Miliband is the, uh, the the labor leader running for prime minister, and that's a pretty important statement. And I appreciate that he said that. In fact, uh, when a lot of times people, since I call myself a, a Christian Zionist, people accuse me of being in favor of everything Israel does, and I I say no, I don't agree with all of Israel's policies, but I do believe that God gave the land Israel, and that God is going to continue to let Israel live there and no matter what all the other nations of the world do. Now also there's a story out of Ireland that uh, Israel may finally have some luck with the Irish. This is also in the Times of Israel. Uh, currently presiding over the European Union, Ireland sends its Jewish defense minister, a longtime supporter of Israel, uh, to represent them at the uh, European Union. So uh, that's a good thing too. Uh, praise the Lord for that. Then a little comment on uh, the uh, the incident on the Temple Mount last would be Friday a week ago, uh, where uh, not only were there uh, rocks thrown after the Friday prayers, which I always think is ridiculous. That that's the effect of going to Muslim prayers as you come out and and become violent uh, when Christians pray. It usually they come into more of a a sweet spirit of peace. Anyway, the uh, uh, Rabbi Yehuda Glick reiterates the call to establish a commission of inquiry into Friday's events on the Temple Mount, and he's calling for the Israel to reestablish their sovereignty over the Temple Mount. Israel retains the utter or absolute sovereignty over the Temple Mount, but they delegate the running of the of the Temple Mount because of the Gold Dome and Al-Aqsa Mosque to the Muslim Waqf, for the Muslim religious authorities, and uh, so this is a call for Israel to exert more of their sovereignty. Uh, and then uh, also there's an incident this week uh, 
on, uh, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday, uh, soldiers shot a terrorist and uh, he th because he threw a firebomb at him and then they searched the area and they found a huge cache of firebomb firebombs. What this is indicating is that there's an increase. Uh, it's not only throwing rocks now in, in these protests throughout the West Bank, but now they're also, uh, they've sort of upped the ante and they've started to make uh, manufacture homemade uh, firebombs to make it, uh, makes it much more dangerous, of course. And then some good news. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is still rising with the, with the approach of spring, the snow melt and, and so forth. Need to keep praying for rain, but uh, it's now just a few, uh, like a meter, three feet or so short of its maximum. If it reaches that other three feet, they'll actually have to open the floodgates on the Jordan River going south and, and let some of the water go down the Jordan River. And that's what I'm praying for. I think that'd be the biggest victory for the rain and snow this year. And so uh, in Zechariah 10 verse 1 says, pray for rain for Israel in the time of latter rain. So we need to pray. And then there was another incident in the, um, the uh, talks with Iran um, from, I think, yeah, the At Atomic Energy Agency, International Atomic Energy Agency had talks going on with Iran. And one of the Iranian representatives who's got on a big rant against Israel and accused Israel of genocide. And when he did, uh, the Obama administration stood, the representatives stood up and walked out of the meeting and walked right out when, uh, when Israel was accused of genocide. And uh, in addition to them, so did the Australia, New Zealand, and Canada representatives. All four of them walked right out. And uh, the uh, Zionist Organization of America praised the Obama administration for taking that stand. And, and I do too. And then um, there's an article, I may write about it on my blog this week if I get a chance, if that's what I feel like the Lord says. But there's an article, an, an actual uh, opinion article in the Los Angeles Times this, this past week. Uh, actually beginning to define using the word patriots instead of the way it's always been considered in America as patriotic standing with with America they're now beginning to use the word patriot as though it was a dirty word as and it says those are the ones that are dangerous and talking about the Tea Party and and the people who stand for the Second Amendment and so forth accusing them of being patriots as though it's a bad thing and that the government ought to investigate them. In fact, it even it even goes down to the point where uh, they should, even if even if the U.S. government has to take money away from protecting Americans from foreign terrorists to investigate these patriots, that they, they, they should shift the attention to that. That's a very serious article. It's in the Los Angeles Times, and if you want to try to look it up, it's uh, called "Peril from Patriots," and um, it was in the Los Angeles Times. Um, Where's the date here? March 8th. Uh, March 8th is when it ran in the LA Times. So um, you might want to look that up. And then one final item. I mentioned uh, the religious police in uh, Israel. Of course, you hear about, uh, more about the religious pe police in uh, Saudi Arabia because they actually literally have religious police who police uh, people and make them uh, s stick to the Muslim religion. Israel is not quite that official, but they do have the ultra-Orthodox can be pretty uh, pretty nasty, really. And uh, the, the rabbinate is upset, up in arms, as they come into Passover, as we come into Passover next week uh, in, in uh, Israel and around the world. Uh, it says a, a, a pack of kosher for Passover wafers, like some cookies, uh, looks too much like the regular kind of wafers that have leaven in them. And the people might be confused when they're trying to buy Passover cookies, they may accidentally buy uh, regular cookies that have leaven in them, and so the rabbinate is all up in arms that the packages ought to be different. They ought to be labeled differently. And, uh, and I'm all for uh, getting, out, getting, getting the leaven out, but let's keep in mind that what, we're, what it's really talking about is sin. <laughs> Remove the leaven of sin. Uh, that's what Jesus came for. He became the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world. And it's not about whether the package of cookies looks like regular cookies or Passover cookies and there's a problem with how close they look. Uh, that's just an example of, of the extremes that you can go to uh, trying to trying to establish your own righteousness by the things you do. We can never do that. Uh, we can only receive righteousness imputed 
by believing God, just as Abraham did. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness, Paul says in Romans 4, even before he was circumcised. And so that's our stance. We believe in the Messiah, and that's where we get our righteousness. Well, uh, thank you for being with us again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you that Yeshua is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And as we uh, turn our hearts to Passover it, for the next couple of weeks and turn in that direction, Lord, I just pray that, that we would recognize that righteousness is imputed because we believe you and we, we know that you're the God who always keeps his word. You are the covenant-keeping God, the faithful God. Thank you. You are Jehovah, God of Israel, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we bless you and thank you for your life. In the name of Yeshua ben Yehovah, Jesus, the Son of God. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Shalom, shalom. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.